Welcome to the Cambridge Financial Podcast with Bert Salazar, CEO at Cambridge Financial Partners, LLC. This podcast is all about tax-preferred retirement planning, economics, financial risk management, and achieving a risk-free and successful financial life. Now, your host, Bert Salazar. Bert Salazar. Hey, good day, everyone. Uh, welcome to another Cambridge uh, podcast. I'm excited to be here with all of you, as uh, I am every single week uh, of every single year, uh, because at the end of the day, we want to make certain that uh, we provide uh, not only information to all of you, but also that we provide uh, strong education along those lines. Now, today's webcast is, um, is called, uh, Do You Have a Financial Plan B? And that's a very interesting question because every time that we visit with clients, um, you know, one of the main questions that always comes up is, do you have a plan B? Uh, and many a times, uh, most of the people that we engage uh, have plan Bs. And we would argue that normally when you have a plan B, that means that your plan A is not as suitable or as efficient as it should be. So today, I'm going to give you a little bit of feedback as to the difference between a financial plan A and a financial plan B. So, you know, I hope all of you are ready. I hope that all of you are, are excited. Uh, obviously, we're going to be spending some good quality time. Uh, this is not going to be a very long uh, uh, podcast, but it's going to be a very important one for all of you. Now, couple uh, what I call thoughts of the day, I have a couple of them for you. Uh, number one, only when the tide goes down will you know who is swimming naked. You know, most clients uh, in today's environment are doing fairly well financially, but when things don't go the way they're supposed to, uh, that's when you know when somebody has a plan B as opposed to a plan A. Uh, and then obviously, uh, your plan, your financial plan A, uh, when your financial plan A is flawed uh, in any way, shape, or form, your financial plan B becomes more relevant. Why? Because if you're not fully prepared uh, f- to have a strong financial uh, or plan A, then chances are your financial plan B is not going to be as suitable uh, as uh, it should have been from from that perspective. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the features and benefits of a financial plan A. And and by the way, in our firm and the type of work, work that we do for all our, all our clients, uh, we always stress the fact that if you have a very strong plan A, uh, you don't need a plan B. And, and I'll go into some of the t- details along those lines. Now, uh, plan A is primarily designed uh, and is based on, on managing retirement risk uh, and being able to either transfer or avoid uh, the many risks that come with retirement distribution planning and the many, uh, the many challenges that most Americans are going to have to deal with in the future. You know, life has a way to get in the way. And when life gets in the way, if you're not prepared to deal with all the, the ups and downs, then chances are both you and your family are going to suffer uh, gravely from a business standpoint. Now, a very strong plan A has uh, four major components. And these are the four major risks that each and every one of you, as you're preparing for retirement or preparing your retirement plan, should be aware of and should be managing uh, or try to uh, prevent from a business perspective. And the first part of the component is, you know, how do you manage the risk of dying too soon? We'll spend a little bit of time on this in the next few minutes, uh, but I just want to share with you what the four components are. Uh, The risk of dying too soon, uh, the risk of living too long, the risk of living with a disability, and the risk of living with eroding factors, and I'll go into some details. But, you know, if you have a strong plan A and and you have done your due diligence with your, you know, financial advisor or your CPA or your tax preparer or or your retirement strategist, if you have a strong plan A, uh, you should uh, have done proper planning in order to mitigate uh, the potential circumstances that could come uh, from any one of those four risks that I've just talked about. Now, uh, obviously, uh, Plan A, uh, there are many different advisors out in the marketplace and many companies that may do it a little bit different. But you know, the, uh, whenever we do a, uh, any type of customized retirement blueprint for clients, you know, we, ca- we kind of try to put all their assets into a financial model. And, and we call it an economic model because it does more than just financial. Uh, 
Now, if you're going to have a proper model in place, um, it should have a number of um, items that would be very, very critical for all of you on this call. Number one, the model should be organized. Uh, number two, it should be coordinated. That means that, you know, the assets inside the model should be coordinating with one another. Uh, number three, it should be optimized. Every drawer that you have in the model um, uh, should be optimized to make sure that the assets that you have inside those drawers are performing to the highest level possible. Uh, the model should be uh, scientific in nature, so that would be number four. And number five, it should be integrated. Now, when I, when I said scientific in nature, you know, there are certain uh, economic rules uh, that most, uh, uh, f most uh, people should be able to follow. The challenge is that the vast majority of clients that we engage for the first time have never been advised and have never studied uh, economics, so it's very difficult for them uh, to follow rules and that do not exist in their minds. Now, uh, by the same token, uh, this model needs to be rule-based, uh, and, and the rules-based uh, model provides for a separation uh, of assets in different areas. So the traditional economic model is comprised of 27 drawers. Uh, there are nine drawers in each section of the model. And the model has uh, three sections. You have the protection section, you have the savings uh, section, and then you have the growth uh, section of the model um, that uh, creates uh, all of the different uh, rules of engagement that you should have from a planning perspective. Now, uh, one of the interesting things about the models that we use is that it serves as a game board uh, for our clients to be able to view uh, their financial decisions uh, through a telescope as opposed to a microscope. You've heard me in other podcasts uh, talking about the difference between microscope and telescope. And, and the interesting thing about looking at your assets and uh, at your uh, money management and your financial decisions through a telescope, it does give you the ability to measure the impact of those decisions on the other side of the ledger. Uh, so it does give you a, a helicopter view of everything that you're doing from a business perspective. Uh, can you imagine if you wanted to play chess and you didn't have a game board? You know, how difficult would it be to, to play a game of chess uh, if you don't have a game board to, to follow? So the same thing happens in, in finances. Uh, the vast majority of the clients that we engage um, uh, come to us with no game board, uh, they they have made decisions uh, primarily, you know, f uh, one at a time uh, with different people for different purposes under different sets of circumstances, and and no wonder the vast majority of Americans are not, and I repeat, are not financially independent when they reach uh, retirement age. Uh, now, uh, let's talk a little bit about the four major risks that I discussed uh, a few minutes ago. So, uh, when we talk about the risk of dying too soon, this is one of the major risks that we try to address with our clients on an ongoing basis. Uh, no, number one, no one ever dies at the right time. And, and that's so critically important to, to realize because, you know, pretty much uh, your past is a memory. The future is a dream. It's not promised to anyone. Um, so obviously the present uh, is here today. So the fact that no one ever dies at the right time, you know, goes by the same premises that I've been in this industry almost 30 years. Uh, and I have had clients that have had premature death in their 40s, in their 50s. Uh, some of my clients have died in their 90s. Uh, but then again, tomorrow's promise to no one. To, so you want to make certain that you can protect your family and your assets accordingly. Now, the other issue when you're dealing with the risk of dying too soon, and this is something we address often with our clients, is, you know, how do you measure the economic impact of a premature death on family income and assets? Uh, that's a critical question. Now, most of um, uh, most of the clients that we engage and that have purchased, um, you know, life insurance in order to protect, you know, the, or protect against the risk of dying too soon, uh, usually, uh, they do it on a, on a needs basis as opposed to on, on the value of an economic life. Uh, we at Cambridge uh, concentrate on providing the most amount of value uh, that you can provide to your client uh, at minimum cost. Uh, so obviously, you know, how do you measure the economic impact? Uh, fixed expenses, 
uh, you need to be able to look at living expenses. Uh, there are something that we call forced uh, living expenses, uh, which are family unit promises. You know, um, if you're providing education for your children, you know, how are you going to mitigate that? You know, at the end of the day, uh, you want to make certain that in case of a premature death, that your family is, too, is totally protected. Uh, you would not want, I know I wouldn't, you would not want your family to have to change uh, and, and reduce their standard of living uh, just because uh, one of the family unit members is no longer uh, no longer here. So obviously doing all those calculations are very critical. We spend a lot of time in educating our clients um, and not only about you know how to measure that risk and how to me measure the economic impact, but also how to max uh, how to maximize the internal rate of return on whatever recommendations uh, we would make at that point in time. Uh, another question is well, self insurance versus risk uh, transfer. You know, some clients may say, well, you know, I have plenty of assets, so I'm going to self insure. Uh, and, and that could be okay, but you know, also you have to figure out where it is that the assets are invested in. You know, what if the assets are in the, in the stock market and there's a premature death and there's a market crash? All of a sudden, your 401k becomes a 201k. And I don't care if you had a million, a million and a half dollars in that 401k, uh, obviously after those losses are suffered and now your family has to dip in in order to maintain their standard of living at a point in time that they may not want to do so because of market conditions and, you know, that's where the double taxation comes into play as I have discussed in the past. Um, obviously for, you know, num a number of our clients that have pension benefits, you know, how do you make those pension benefits uh, decisions? So you Usually pension systems, if you happen to be one of those lucky Americans that have access to a pension si system, you know, give you different choices. Well, does it make a, does it make a better choice uh, to buy that uh, survivor benefit inside the system or outside the system or outside the system? So uh, those numbers remain to, to be seen. Now, there are times where, you know, buying those pension survivor benefits inside of the system make more sense. But most of the time, if you do it outside of the system, obviously would be mo uh, more beneficial to you and your family. And then obviously, uh, if you decide to transfer that risk to an insurance company for a premium, then you know what company you're going to use, uh, what product are you going to use, uh, how much um, uh, insurance are you going to, to purchase. Remember, you know, when you are protecting your family from the risk of dying too soon, uh, and you're buying life insurance, pretty pretty much what you are doing is you're buying uh, dollars at a discount. Uh, so obviously, um, you're, it's like it's like uh, a mortgage. You know, you're uh, you know you're you when someone dies, is that money in escrow? and escrow closes uh, the day someone dies. So when you buy life insurance, at least from the death benefit uh, the death benefit aspect of it, because there's always a cash value and retirement distribution planning benefits of it as well. But on the death benefit side, uh, it's very important to understand that you gotta think of it as money in escrow, and escrow closes the day someone dies, and the benefits are paid, are paid to the beneficiaries on a tax uh, on a federal income tax uh, free basis. Now, uh, the second area that we are discussing is the risk of living too long. And this, this is one that is the opposite of dying too soon, and the vast majority of Americans are living a lot longer today than they did in the past. Uh, so, but then again, you know, living a long life or having longevity in, in, your, in your life also provides uh, certain planning challenges that we'll discuss in, in the next few a few minutes. Now, uh, number one is longevity probabilities. You know, what is the probability that you and your and your spouse, uh, if you happen to be married, are going to live a long life? Uh, and those are things. Obviously, you know, health plays a uh, plays a major role. Uh, how do you take care of yourself? Um, uh, how much do you weigh? Do you exercise? Are are you someone that is is fairly active? Uh, although you may not exercise. So all those things uh, play uh, into into the consideration of making a determination, although tomorrow's promise to no one, but uh, you can you can run probabilities along those lines. Um, how about your parents? How about your siblings? How long, how long uh, have they lived? Uh, or how long, how long did they live? Uh, so those are things that are very critical to understand when you are 
uh, trying to protect against the risk of living too long. Uh, the other one that we'll discuss in another uh, few minutes will be longevity buckets. And we call those, you know, the go-go years, the slow-go years, and then the no-go years. Uh, one of the major issues that we deal with clients often now, especially because of the fact that what used to kill Americans 30, 40 years ago is no longer doing that, is, you know, running out of income before you run out of life. If getting old is bad, uh, getting old and being broke is even worse. So there's one thing that you never want to do is you don't want to run out of income before you run out of life. Now, how are you going to be able to uh, to guard against that? What are some of the uh, the options that you may have available along those lines? Um, uh, obviously, longevity planning will also take into consideration Social Security planning. You know, do you start taking Social Security at 62? Do you take it at 66 or 67? Do you wait until 70? Uh, One of the challenges that we have with uh, many of our clients when we discuss Social Security is that a lot of the decisions that they want to make regarding Social Security distribution is based on a microeconomic basis and is not based on a macroeconomic basis. Uh, When we do the calculations for Social Security distribution, uh, we bring about a different world that our clients uh, have never even considered. And when we do so, our clients are giving us a tremendous amount of kudos uh, because of the fact that we're uh, bringing some economic uh, truth uh, to the table uh, that many of our clients are not exposed to unless uh, you're dealing with uh, a retirement strategist. Um, Asset distribution planning. You know, um, do you have everything in one bucket um, as you start to retire? Remember, when you go into retirement and you're just making a paradigm shift, you're going from people at work to assets at work, and how do you manage that distribution is very critical. Which assets are you going to are you going to invade first? Which assets are you going to inv- are you going to invade second and third and fourth uh, and so forth? Uh, and then obviously, uh, how do you create retirement income guarantees? Ninety nine percent of the clients that we engage, when I ask the questions, uh, the uh, the questions to them, one of the one of the questions that I do ask is, well, if you have a choice in retirement, uh, would you ra- would you rather have your income to be guaranteed or to be non non guaranteed? Ninety nine percent of them will say that they want their income to be guaranteed. Uh, in retirement from a business perspective. So, and and then how do you guarantee those incomes? Well, you know, there are risk management options. Obviously, every case is different, but you do have uh, immediate annuities, you have pensions, and you also have index annuities uh, that you can set up to create uh, guaranteed income. Um, uh, Yesterday, I was having uh, lunch uh, with uh, two attorneys that are good friends of mine. And, uh, you know, one of the questions at the table came up was, you know, Bert, nowadays with the way the market is uh, and what is happening historically in the United States over the last 20 years, you know, how do you determine uh, whether somebody is, uh, someone is lower middle class, middle class, upper middle class, or wealthy? Uh, and, and my response to them caught them by surprise, and they actually acknowledged that they never, never thought of it. And, and my response to them is that, you know, I don't measure the wealth of an individual uh, by the amount of assets that they own. I measure the wealth of an individual uh, by the amount of cash flow that they can generate on an annual basis in order to maintain their standard of living for many, many years uh, to come, uh, and obviously not only for themselves, but also to their family. Now, remember I I mentioned the um, longevity buckets and the the go-go years, the slow-go years, and the no-go years? Well... Um, the go-go years is when people primarily retire. So if you have a retirement age of 65 or 66, over the ne- next 10 years, so between 65 and 75, if you happen to be fairly healthy, uh, you may be spending more money than you did prior to retirement. The reason for that is that you're healthy, you're on the go, you're going to do a lot of traveling that you haven't done for many years. Uh, because you've been working most of your life and setting money aside for your retirement uh, years. Uh, So you're going to be on the go-go all the time. Now, once um, uh, people get into their mid-70s to mid-80s, so mid-80s, so between the ages of 75 to 85, uh, you get into what I call the slow-go years. Uh, You're not traveling as much as you did in your go-go years. Uh, Your health uh, may not be as good. 
you know, you may be so want, you may want to stay closer to home, closer to your children, closer to your grandchildren, uh, for sure, if you have any. Uh, so you're slowing down a little bit. Now, you're not at a standstill yet, uh, but you're slowing down compared to the go-go years. Now, you may still take trips from time to time. Uh, they're not going to be as long as they used to be in the past. Uh, and they're not going to be as far, but uh, you may still be a little bit active, but not as active as you were in the go-go years. Uh, once you hit your mid-80s, then obviously other issues are going to take over. Uh, Medicare, obviously health conditions are going to take over. Uh, and, and the no-go years uh, go from the age of 85 uh, to 95 in, in my bucket scenario, but could be 100, could be 105. The fastest growing population in the U.S. today are people reaching the age of 100. Uh, so obviously, once you get into the no-go years, <laughs> your number one goal in life is to wake up on the green side of the grass every single day for as long as you possibly can. Now, how do you man manage the assets? Uh, between the go-go years, the slow-go years, and, uh, and the no-go years? Well, the a some of the assets are going to be the same. Uh, some of the assets may not be the same. Uh, how do you manage uh, the cost of uh, health care? It's going to be greater in the future than it is uh, in your go-go years. So your slow-go years and the no-go years, the cost of health care is going to be higher than in your go-go years. So you have to also be able to manage uh, the distribution of your assets in order to maximize uh, your longevity planning. Now, one of the um, areas that I have uh, major discussions with my clients is that I want to make certain that whenever we do any type of planning, that we have to plan at least uh, three decades of, of uh, asset distribution. Uh, for some of my public employees, uh, especially public safety employees, uh, in which they have a tendency to retire earlier in their 50s, then we need to plan for four decades uh, of retirement distribution planning. Uh, now, obviously, we've talked a little bit about the risk of dying too soon and the risk of li uh, living too long. Uh, the third risk is the risk of living with a disability. And, and that one goes uh, pretty much hand in hand with the, the risk of um, uh, living too long because although what used to kill us uh, 30, 40 years ago, as I said earlier, um, is not killing us anymore. Uh, because of the fact that we're living longer, uh, we're more susceptible to having disabilities. Uh, obviously, uh, major health cares, uh, Alzheimer's, um, um, you know, Parkinson's disease, you know, heart disease, and disease um, uh, strokes, uh, they become more evident as people uh, live longer and longer in their lives. Uh, the big question is, well, how do you manage that risk? Uh, and, and how do you manage it uh, where, where whether it, it, your, your disability became or became, uh, became evident uh, in pre-retirement or post-retirement? You know, what if you become disabled just before you retire? What financial impact is that going to have on your family? What if you become disabled um, as soon as you retire? Uh, again, what impact is that going to have? Or what if you become disabled in your mid-70s? or early 80s, how's your family going to cope with that? One of the uh, major discussions as well that we talk to our clients about deal with the, you know, what is the impact of long-term care? And, and the vast majority of the clients and the people that I talk to, and when we do uh, webinars and seminars uh, to the masses, the, the vast majority of Americans uh, truly have never, ever sat down to consider uh, and I'm talking about the vast majority of Americans, the impact of a long-term care. Uh, number one, what is the cost? Now, I can tell you today in Florida, uh, the average cost of a nursing home is approximately, uh, approximately $92,000. Now, what's going to happen uh, 10 years from now, 15 years, 20, 30 years from now? The, the, the increase or the inflation increase in health care costs in the United States is three times the average inflation rate. So you have to be able to account for that. Um, who are going to be the care providers? Uh, you know, many a times uh, the family may have to uh, take care of that individual that has a need for uh, nursing uh, assistance. Now, it could be uh, it could be a nursing facility, it could be a hospice care, it could be home health care. And, and as people start to get worse, 
um, because of a disability, there's a very high probability uh, that uh, someone is going to end up in a nursing home. Uh, but that brings a tremendous amount of impact on care providers in the United States. Uh, so if, if you have a husband and wife and the husband becomes disabled, uh, usually the, the, the spouse, uh, pretty much their lives are, are going to stop, uh, to stop suddenly because, you know, now they're going to become the care provider. Uh, I have a very good friend of mine whose wife uh, passed away in her early 60s from Alzheimer's. And she suffered from Alzheimer's uh, for about four years. And, and, and he felt like he was sleeping with a stranger uh, because he was sleeping next to his wife and his wife didn't know who he was and he didn't know who she was. So you have to be able to, to factor that in as well uh, from a care provider standpoint. Uh, Medicare coverage availability. There's pretty much none. You know, Medicare does not cover long-term care. Uh, and many of the clients that we engage uh, never thought that Medicare would not cover long-term care, but that's a fact. So how are you going to mitigate that additional cost? Uh, also, uh, over the last uh, uh, five years, Medicaid rules have changed. So, uh, you know, in the old days, you could uh, do an uh, asset spend down, so you could start spending down your assets, and then Medicaid would come in and take care of the additional cost of care uh, for that individual uh, under a disability. Now, remember, most of these uh, long-term care uh, disability policies will tell you that, you know, you have to uh, at least fail to be able to do two of the ADLs, which are the activities of daily living. So you do qual if you do qualify for that, then obviously you may have some coverage, some coverage if you have any type of individual coverage yourself. But Medicaid rules, if you start spending down assets in order to have Medicaid come in, uh, and take care of that additional cost of long-term care, then what impact is that going to have on the, on the, on the survivor uh, spouse uh, that may still be alive at the point in time where that individual uh, patient that had a long-term care need, you know, passes away and there's no more assets uh, left or very, very little assets available to continue to maintain the standard of living for that surviving spouse that, that, are, that is still alive and that, and that took that uh, detrimental uh, decrease in assets because uh, he or she needed to provide uh, that care uh, to that uh, loved one uh, that they had been with for so many years. So, you know, those are things that very, very few Americans have actually considered. Now, what are some of the risk management options that you can use in order to offset that liability? Well, you know, you can buy straight out uh, long-term care policies, and they're quite expensive. Uh, one of the challenges with long-term care policies is, let's say that you buy one at the age of 50 and you happen to die in your sleep at the age of 85. Well, obviously, no one is going to get a benefit, so all that premium that was paid for 30, year, 35, 30 years uh, or 35 years, and then the opportunity cost on that premium uh, just goes nowhere. So one of the things that I try to address with my clients all the time is that, look, the vast majority of us uh, want to go to bed at night and not wake up the next day. None of us want to be in a, in a nursing home or in a, in a nursing facility at all. I know I wouldn't. Too. I've been there a few times to see friends and clients, and believe me, that's not a place I want to I want to end up in. Uh, but then again, you know, we don't have any control of that. Uh, but the one question that I do ask my clients often is, look, if you get uh, what you want, which 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 means, you know, dying on the side of the angels and just going to bed and not waking up. Why should it cost you money? Because in a long-term care scenario, if you get what you, what you want, that premium that you paid and the opportunity, what you could have done with that premium uh, has, gone away, uh, has gone away in perpetuity for the rest of your life. So you want to make certain that you, know, you can find uh, ways of providing those um, protection options without having a major cost uh, to the client. So... Uh, Companies nowadays are coming out with um, uh, index on uh, long-term care annuities. Uh, so you can use annuities not only for retirement, but you can also use them 
as a way to uh, be able to provide uh, long-term long-term care needs and benefits. Uh, you also have the ability, some insurance companies now have life insurance policies that you can purchase that have long-term care riders. So that means that someone will always, always get the benefit, the same as if you have an index long-term care annuity. Uh, uh, therefore, you know, if you have a million dollars in life insurance benefit, to protect uh, your family, and then you have a need for long-term care, you can actually dip into those assets, and either you can use it all, or even if you use a portion of it, uh, and after you use a portion, let's say you use half a million of the million-dollar assets, and uh, you pass away, then your surviving spouse and your beneficiaries under the contract uh, will receive the additional income. If you died in your sleep and you never had a need to use um, long-term care at all, uh, then upon your death, uh, those assets uh, would go uh, again on a tax-preferred ba- basis uh, to your beneficiaries if it was inside a life insurance contract. And if it's an annuity contract, then you can obviously pass it on uh, to your beneficiaries from a business perspective. So uh, there are many options. Um, which option is the best? Uh, my answer is always the same. Well, it depends. It depends on your individual circumstances. It depends on, you know, what it is that is critical for all of you and how do we mitigate that risk. And then the last risk uh, that, w- that I want to share uh, with you today is obviously uh, the risk of uh, living with eroding factors. And, you know, what are eroding factors? Well, eroding factors to me is anything can, that can erode the value of your assets and the value of your money, the value of your cash flow and the value of your income in retirement. Uh, and normally, uh, there are a number of uh, eroding factors that I address with clients often. Uh, number one is taxes. Number two is inflation. Number three is uh, stock market volatility. Uh, number four is interest rate volatility. Number five, financial fees, expenses, uh, losses that you may have incurred uh, in certain investments. Uh, number six, uh, opportunity costs. Uh, and these comes from, you know, m- many of our clients are, pay- are paying way too much money in taxes or actually paying more taxes than they need to. That's an opportunity cost. Uh, propensity to consume. I deal with clients that are, that are spenders. I deal with other clients that are savers. Um, how do you manage uh, the risk of eroding factors depends on the type of individual that you may be. Uh, now, in in a married couple situation, you may have the husband being a spender or vice versa and the, the, sp- the, the wife being a, a saver or vice versa. So you need to be able to identify spending habits and how to minimize that while maximizing their standard of living. Uh, repairs and maintenance costs, you know, things, um, life happens. You know, if you own a home and you're in retirement, well, roofs are going to have to be replaced or repaired. Uh, furniture, uh, refrigerators, microwaves, uh, automobiles, you know, so the pr- propensity to consume and how do you deal with that uh, becomes a major issue when it comes to um, uh, those uh, eroding factors that we've talked about. And then last but not least is lawsuits. What if you're driving down the street and you run a red light or you run a stop sign and you hit someone and you either disable them or you kill them or they suffer major damages, um, obviously they're, uh, they're going to be filing a lawsuit. You know, are your assets protected? If they're not protected, you might as well kiss them goodbye. So it is very critical to make certain that as you prepare uh, for this type of planning, uh, that you're able to to maximize uh, the protection and and that uh, you can protect uh, against all of those things that can happen when it comes to the risk of dying too soon, or living too long, or living with a disability or living with all of those eroding factors that we have just discussed. Uh, So those are the features and benefits that we engage in order to create a customized tax preferred retirement uh, distribution plan for our clients. So for us, uh, plan A is always the plan. Uh, And if you have a proper plan A, then you don't need a plan B. Uh, But by the same token, uh, the title of this podcast was, you know, do you have a financial plan B? And and let me give you uh, very quickly what the features 
of a financial plan B look like? Your assets are not organized. They're definitely not coordinated. They're not optimized. Uh, no one is using any type of scientific approach to your financial decision-making process. These assets are, uh, assets are not integrated with one another because of the fact that you made those decisions one at a time with different people for different reasons, a different, a different, uh, and different investors and different planners. So therefore, there's no integration whatsoever and they're definitely not rules based. So obviously there's no game board, uh, so you're flying blind uh, in, in your attempt to reach a successful retirement life. And then many, sadly enough, you know, many clients that we have engaged in the past have a hope and pray attitude uh, toward retirement. And, and I can tell you that hope is definitely not a uh, financial alternative. You have to make certain that you can do your very best in order to maximize the internal rate of return and your retirement distribution planning uh, and your retirement life, not only for yourself, but also for your spouse and your family from a business standpoint. Now, obviously, uh, final thoughts. I, you know, I always say that you know, our goal here at Cambridge is to kind of help you change uh, the way that you see things. Because when you do change the way that you see things, the things that you see change. So again, uh, if you have any questions regarding this podcast or you want to discuss uh, any specific topic uh, that I just covered or any other topic that we've covered in previous uh, podcast, uh, please feel free to, you know, reach out and schedule a 30 minute uh, either conference call or video conference call. I love to do video conferences because and we get to see each other and we get to share ideas. And, and by the way, these um, uh, video conferences are at no cost and no obligation to, to any of you. Uh, if you're interested in, in reaching out to us, uh, feel free to contact me at area code 786 766 1042. You can also email me and I'll give you two email addresses. My first email address is my business email address, which is Bert, B E R T dot Salazar, S A L A Z A R, at Cambridge, F S N Frank, P S N Paul, L L C dot com. Or you can also email me at Bert, B E R T at bertsalazar.com. Again, thank you for giving me a few minutes of your time, and we'll talk again next week. Take care.